afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager at Barometer Capital, and we welcome you so warmly to another Barometer Readings webcast. Joining me as always is David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Strategist and President at Barometer. And on today's webcast, we will be pleased to provide you a macro overview and, of course, address your questions at the tail end of the conversation. So don't be shy. You can email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca or hit me up on the Q&A or the chat via Zoom. And with that, on this uh, very beautiful spring uh, afternoon, I turn the conversation over to David Burroughs, although I hear it's a little chilly in Toronto right now. Oh, it's not so bad. We'll take this over the middle of February anytime. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, everybody, for, for joining us today. Uh, the, the calendar is flipping. Uh, we're working our way into the later part of May uh, and certainly lots to talk about. Uh, we've had uh, over the last month um, news on the inflation front, which in general is a little bit better. We had earnings data, which in general came in a little bit better. But of course, we got this debt ceiling uh, hanging over us, uh, which is uh, being made full use of for theatrical purposes. Uh, I think we all agree it's highly likely that this uh, will get resolved. But in the meantime, things, lots of things for people to talk about and worry about. Uh, and uh, as it has been for many months, uh, we have a very bifurcated market. We have uh, some folks who are exceedingly bearish uh, with concerns about the longer term impacts of the Fed tightening cycle, as they say, long and lagging effects. Uh, and uh, on the other side, we've had a market that's been digesting bad news now for 18 months. Uh, and uh, by, by many accounts, uh, there is a belief that we've done a lot of the heavy lifting. Uh, and the market should start looking out beyond the impacts of a Fed tightening cycle. Uh, so uh, without having an opinion, let's let's start out and just from a, a high level uh, and look at what we see from the market's perspective. So as, as most of you know, our view is that uh, asset prices go in long cycles, uh, and this is equities, and we had bull markets from 1981 through 2000, a very long bull market from 1951 through 1966, a very good bull market in late 1920s, and we've had a bull market going in U.S. stocks since 2013, certainly with interruptions. When we look at it under a little bit more of a microscope, uh, we know that during the long structural bull markets, you have you know, a series of significant uh, corrections, both in time and in price. And this has been no different. We've been now 17 months uh, that the worst point in October, the S&P was down 27%. As it says right now, we're down about 13% off the highs. Uh, we've been through 17 months, which would be very typical of a bear market heading into a recession. You know, we've made the comparison to what happened in 1990-91, which was obviously a very significant recession. There were a whole bunch of banks that disappeared during that period, a whole bunch of savings and loans. Um, the market was down during that period 20 and a half percent, took about 18 months to resolve. And of course, then it set up the second half of a long structural bull market. So uh, this bull market has been about nine years since 2013's breakout. Uh, the bull market in the 80s and 90s was, was 18 years. Um, so by any count, this, if it is over, would be one of the shorter long-term bull markets in history. Uh, and so we don't believe that's the case. We continue to be above this rising green 200 week moving average, which we touched briefly uh, in, uh, in October. We touched briefly and closed above it in 2020. We touched it briefly in December of 2018. None of those times were a time to get overly bearish. Now we've been over six months since the market's low. Uh, and certainly there's, there's stocks that are doing well, the stocks are doing poorly, sectors that are doing better, some sectors doing worse. Uh, but, you know, this is a process going through a bottoming, uh, and we think that we are working our way through it. There's some notable things that we've talked about over the last few weeks. One of them has been that for the first time in many years, EFI or the rest of the world is outperforming the S&P. Uh, and when we've seen transition points between global stocks outperforming 
or U.S. stocks outperforming that lasted longer than a year, it tended to persist. So we think that is a change that's important to recognize. I think our job really as managers is to recognize big structural shifts. We don't have to be everywhere. Um, there's a time to be heavily focused in the U.S. There's a time to be focused outside the U.S. And perhaps it is that we are headed into one of those periods where it makes more sense to be looking for ideas outside the U.S. after global stocks have underperformed really since 2008. So 15 years. Uh, if we look at the history, the history is once global stocks outperform for 12 months, it tends to be persistent in late blue. These are all periods where global stocks significantly outperform the S&P, uh, and that's certainly been the case so far over the course this year. Again, from a big picture perspective, when we look at long-term interest rates, they do move in big, broad uh, swath cycles. Uh, we know that rates rose in general from the late, late 1940s to 1981. Then over that period, there were fits and starts of inflation. There were Fed tightening cycles. There were some bear markets. But stocks did really, really well from 1951 through 1966 during a period of higher and higher interest rates. So I get it that there is fear when the Fed goes through a tightening cycle. I get it that it is meant to slow the economy down. But in slowing the economy down, they're trying to elongate the financial cycles. And so it may well be that Main Street is hurt by this tightening. It may be that some sectors and companies will be hurt by this tightening. But the goal is not to let inflation get out of hand. And the goal is to let the economy catch up, uh, fill the supply chains, uh, maybe create a little bit of slack in the labor market so that ultimately companies can continue to grow their profits and the economy can remain balanced. But we do think that we saw a generational low in yields in 2020 as they were giving money away for free during COVID. It was the lowest rates in a thousand years and since then rates have been working their way higher. This is a chart that we've put up many, many times over the last three years as we've been doing these webcasts. This was the long decline in rate, decline in rates from the early 1980s, a reversal. And we've talked over the last number of months about the fact that rates, long-term rates, were consolidating above these long-term moving averages. Now, it would be rare to see a reversal in direction against the direction of the long-term moving averages without there being some kind of consolidation. That's what we've had. But interestingly, in this last month, we've seen long-term rates break out of this consolidation and start ticking higher again. Now, why is that important? Because during the period where rates fell for 40 years, anytime they rallied, investors learned that they should buy the dip or go out and buy some bonds as yields went higher. And that has been the case over the last eight months. Lots and lots of people focused on buying bonds thinking, boy, this is a great deal. Well, for all of those people that were buying the long end of the treasury market, through 2022 uh, and uh, early part of 2023, you can see treasury prices starting to fall again. So we've now had a high, high in 2020, a lower high in 2021, a lower high in 2022, a lower high in 2023, and working our way lower again. So our comment has been, until some of these things change, Long bonds are in a bear market. We now have declining long-term moving averages, and that's just a reality. So something to keep in mind, what feels good often is the wrong thing. Uh, so we've been very careful with the US long, long end of the US bond market. In fact, in our macro fund, we've been short through most of this past number of months uh, and uh, will continue to be. A relationship that I wanna keep putting on the screen is that there was a very tight relationship between the NASDAQ 100 in black and the TLT, which we were just looking at, all the way through the bear market. Now, the TLT had a bounce, and the NASDAQ started to bounce, and the NASDAQ continued to rally. The TLT has been now selling off. So it's opened up quite a chasm between these two, or jaws. I said on the last call, it may well be one will likely have to follow the other. We'll have to see. 
But it's one of the reasons that while the QQQ or the NASDAQ 100 and the biggest cap tech stocks have been performing well, we've been careful not to overweight the group because ultimately if yields start to move higher again, our long-term bond prices start to move lower, there has been a pretty tight correlation. Not to say it can't change, but when long-term rates go higher, it means the discount rate you have to use on earnings way out many number of years increases and that decreases the value of those future earnings. So something just to keep in mind, something we are certainly watching. From a commodity perspective, we reversed a long-term downtrend in 2020. We've been consolidating over this last many months while the Fed has been hiking rates. Frankly, surprising that commodities have held up as well as they have, despite the fact we've had such a sharp uh, tightening cycle. But that has been the case. We moved up and out of this uh, consolidation. We've ticked down along that consolidation line to put it under a closer microscope. This is the broad-based commodities ETF. We broke out a few weeks ago and we've just moved sort of down along the top, top of this trend line. My guess is we probably resolve higher shortly, but that's something to keep an eye on. Now, I get questions from investors saying, it's been consolidating for a long time. How long can this go on for? Well, consolidations often can tax your patience. And as individuals, as humans, we have a certain amount of patience and sometimes markets can test those patients. But at this point, I think that this consolidation is intact and is likely to resolve higher because you tend to come out of a flag in the direction you came in. And we did see a reversal in direction back in 2020. When commodities start to outperform after underperforming for a long period of time, it tends to last for quite a long period of time. So we do think that there's a very good payoff to come to have exposure to materials and energy. So whether it's agricultural commodities versus equities, a reversal at the beginning of 2022 and a consolidation, or oil versus the S&P, a reversal in 2022 and a consolidation, or gold versus the S&P and a consolidation. Again, when we get these reversals, they go on for a long, long time. So this is not so different than global stocks versus the S&P reversing a direction. So again, important structural changes to recognize. The hardest time during those transitions is in the months that you go through the transition because you got lots of bulls and bears on both sides of the discussion. Lots of people making the case for why it maybe is false. Lots of people saying why it is that you should pay attention to it. And the market yanks you back and forth and drives you crazy. But I think when you put all of these together, it's very significant and something to be kept an eye on. This move in gold comes out of a cup and handle formation that is now going back 10 years in the making. And we're sitting above this consolidation. My guess is, that we likely continue to move its way higher. Okay, let's talk data for a moment. We had a lot of earnings news over the last four weeks. And as we sit, we're through all of the 500 companies or effectively all of the 500 companies. A few things to take away. We had a 6.5% earnings surprise. So against analyst estimates, companies reported earnings about 6.6% better than estimate. And when you look at the uh, sales and earnings surprises, this reverses a trend where companies were beating by less and less. So putting it under a microscope again, a 6.6% beat is better than many of the most recent quarters. And I think that that's important to look at. Analysts have become very, very cautious about forward-looking earnings. And we know that since we went through the end of earnings period, Forward earnings estimates for the S&P actually have ticked higher coming out of this quarterly result. So again, we're balancing the concern around recession with how much work the market has already done. The market tends to pull back 18 to 25% if you're going to have a typical recession, and it tends to take anywhere from 9 to 18 months. And we got to the high end of both of those 
So the question is, at what point is the market looking beyond it? Or is there a lot more bad economic news to come that hasn't been discounted in? So far, my guess is it looks as though we've discounted a recession. Now, our, our way of looking at the world is very clear. Um, we think that 80% of return comes from identifying the sectors and themes that are benefiting from some kind of structural shift. We just talked about a bunch of structural shifts or asset classes that have benefited from some kind of structural shift. And we wish it would come all at once, but it doesn't. And then we have to find specific securities to use to express that view in portfolios. Our view is we don't have to be in every sector all the time. We want the ones that give us good risk reward. We want to be in the asset classes that give us a tailwind. So just to break that down again, equities in general, we think have a long-term tailwind. Some new strength in global stocks versus US stocks, that's important. That means global equity is more important. Commodities, after many years of a bear market, look to have reversed versus both bonds and stocks looking attractive and certainly under-owned and underpriced. And then there are very specific securities doing well, specific securities doing poorly. We use our top-down modeling to try to identify which sectors and themes are benefiting from new flow of funds. And we just really care about those groups. We don't want to focus on groups where we see money leaving or fewer and fewer stocks participating. We want to see groups where more and more stocks are participating. And then the bottom-up work helps us to find specific ideas to use to build our portfolios out of. And we start with a universe of like 60,000 securities and look for securities that meet some very specific business tests. Companies that meet about 20 different criteria that show change in the income statement and the balance sheet for the better. Ideally, we're looking for securities that are good getting better. We can be choosy. We need 20 to 30 to build the portfolio. So 20 to 30 securities that have improving fundamental characteristics and technical characteristics that align with our positive fundamental view. If we find a company with positive fundamentals, but technically the stock's broken or underperforming, it's not something for now. We want to see the market start to recognize positive change before we put our money to work. And then, of course, that basket is a dynamic basket. And when we go through these transition points, sometimes it's choppy and sometimes we get things wrong. We use stop losses to make sure that little mistakes don't turn into big ones. So in these last few months, certainly we've been stopped out of our share of positions. But my guess is at some point, it's like a sputtering engine. The market catches hold and starts to really lift. And this is what we're looking for. Okay, so breadth is very, very important to us. We know that at the beginning of a Structural shift, a few securities do well, and then a few more, and then a few more. As you go through an advance, one by one, securities should join a rally. That's constructive. That's expanding breadth. Late in the rally, you can get to a point where almost everything's working, and then it starts to narrow. When we get concerned is when there's just a few stocks in the group continuing to perform well while the rest have already reversed. Because ultimately, if breadth breaks down enough, it can get to the strongest constituents. That's something we're wrestling with in tech. And then, of course, if there's poor breadth, we want to raise some cash. We don't want to add new positions. We want to keep our stops relatively tight. And if we get stopped out, cash builds, we wind up well protected. So the last webcast we did was May the 8th. At that point, we said, percent of stocks in uptrends in the NYSE had been declining for a few weeks, meaning narrowing breadth. Doesn't mean there aren't great companies, but it means there are some that are performing weaker than others, and that percentage of stocks was expanding. Canada had also seen some sloppy breadth data, but globally, equities as a whole were showing improving breadth. So that's good for the whole asset class. Behind those long-term statistics that we look at are some shorter-term ones. Percent of stocks trading above the 50-day moving average was improving in the U.S. and globally. But the rest of our short-term indicators had all been showing some deterioration. Percent of stocks with positive weekly momentum 
percent of stocks make new highs versus new lows. In other words, very few new highs. And the percent of stocks trading above their long-term moving average, the 30-week or 150-day moving average, also had been weakening. Well, we missed two weeks, and I apologize for that. I had some personal things I had to take care of. As we sit today, not tons of change, still a mixed market, a little bit of improvement. Percent of stocks globally in uptrends has expanded. Percent of stocks globally trading above their 50-day moving average expanded. In the U.S., percentage of stocks with positive weekly momentum reversed by 6%. In other words, more stocks having positive weekly price momentum. But the number is still just around 50%, which means 50% of stocks have positive weekly momentum and 50% don't. So it's very much about picking your spots. Because breadth for the entire NYSE has been weakening, it means we're not adding a lot of new positions. And we said on our last call, we're gonna kind of sit on our hands and let the market start to resolve. We don't wanna overtrade because choppy markets can grind you up. So we're doing our best to sit on our hands. We're not adding new positions. We continue to wait. Maybe it is that when the debt ceiling gets resolved, that will improve things. Maybe it is that some of the economic data starts to show some improvement. Maybe it is that inflation data continues to come off the boil, but the market's dealing with a lot. Almost every day there's Fed speakers out talking about why it is they may need to continue to tighten or just keep rates tight for a long time. They're trying to get maximum impact out of the Fed's interest rate increases. And there's no shortage of economists who worry about recession. And we have to remember as investors, stock market cycles don't line up with economic cycles. They're offset. They tend to discount them early, way before they happen, and then start to look beyond recessions, often just as they're getting going. Here's where we are in the S&P. The S&P started pulling back in January 2022. We made a low in June and bounced. We made a low in October and bounced. We made a higher low, which was important in December, and then made a higher high. And we broke this long-term downtrend. We got above all the long-term moving averages. But of course, then we were extended above the moving averages and pulled back and tested in March, and then went on to make a higher high. So now we have a low, a high, a higher low, a higher high, a higher low, a higher high, those are all things that are constructive. Long-term moving averages have made a shift, but clearly it's not everything that's rallying. If we look at the equally weighted S&P where you give every one of the 500 constituents the same weight and compare it how the market cap weighted S&P is doing, the average stock is underperforming the market cap weighted S&P. What does that mean? It means that the top five or seven companies in the S&P have dominated the return so far this year, which is difficult because the average person doesn't have all their money in the top seven positions, but over 90% of return in the S&P so far this year has come from those. So what we really do care about is the average stock. That's why we watch breadth. We know that it's only so long that the market can go up driven only by a few stocks. And so we have to be a little cautious. We have to look for a broadening and that's why we're sitting on our hands. It's exceedingly rare that the market cap weighted S&P has outperformed the average stock by so much. It did it in 2020 when you got the juice from the COVID relief. It happened in 1997 well into a tech boom, and that's about it. Very often, then, you see the equally weighted S&P start to catch up. We're watching for improvement in breadth to do that. Let's talk a little bit about leadership. Uh, on May the 8th, we saw, said, saw that the average sector had 36% of its stocks in uptrends, so a minority, but that had been improving. The strongest groups included things like home builders and machinery and precious metals. When we fast forward to today, the average group has 38% of stocks in uptrend, so that's a little bit better and a couple of notable changes. 
Over the last number of webcasts, we've spent a considerable amount of time talking about the financial sector, which was laboring under the impact of weakness in several of the big regional banks. Well, the savings and loans group, which is the regional banks, in capital letters now, has reversed and started to show improving breadth. The large bank sector represented as an ETF by the KBE also has reversed to large caps, which means the percent of stocks and uptrends has started to show some expansion. That's really, really important because those two groups went on to make new lows against the October lows. That was a group that's held the S&P back. It's a group that held the Russell 2000 back. It's a group that held the small cap indices back. And they're now starting to show some improvement. That's something to watch. They're still not all that far off the lows. It is still tenuous, but that's a positive shift. Home builders remain strong. Some of the groups we've talked about, like precious metals and metals producers, have held on to their breadth. Machinery in the, in the industrials group has continued to be positive. We've seen improvement in semiconductors, which we often say is tightly tied to the economic cycle and tightly tied to the health of the market. So there are groups that are improving and groups that are weakening. We want to continue to stay on top of that. So XLK, large cap tech, great outperformance versus the S&P as seen by this rising relative strength line since the beginning of the year. Now, in one way, I wish we had more. In another way, we have to be a little bit careful. This is made up of the largest of large cap tech. Now, I just want to point out here that it has now become very, very extended above the 50-day moving average. And moving averages tend to act as a magnet when you see it pull back, pull, pulls back, rallies to the 50-day, pulls back, rallies to the 50-day, pulls back, rallies to the 50-day, pulls back, trades through the 50-day. But above it, pulls back to the 50-day, rallies well above it. Will it pull back toward the 50-day? It's a possibility. And unless we saw broadening in the technology sector or the NASDAQ itself, it's something that we have to be a little bit cautious of. Now, there's some great companies in this group. And in our top 10 holdings, we do own NVIDIA, which made a new 52-week high as of three days ago, a big beneficiary of the promise of AI, Probably not impacting it today, but arguably AI is going to be a very important theme. Microsoft, also a beneficiary of this AI theme and fervor, but well extended above the 50 and 200 day moving averages. Meta, another company that will be positively impacted likely by AI. Apple and Avago. Avago is Broadcom, the company that provides makes uh, 5G chips. They also provide software for digital communications. Uh, and it had a great run up today, announced a deal where Apple's gonna use the Broadcom chips in a lot of their 5G devices. So this is great, but we can't have all the money here, sadly. When we look at 30, sorry, 5,300 ETFs that trade in the US, only two made relative strength new highs today and they represent the biggest of the big companies. The XLG is the top 50 companies in the S&P 500, or the OEF, which is the top 100 companies in the S&P. A very short list of relative strength new highs. Also of some concern is that when we look at the bullish percent for the OTC or the NASDAQ market, percent of stocks and uptrends actually has been declining since February. So that's something we're watching for signs of reversal. It's improved a little off that low, but we need to see a 6% reversal to move it back into a column of X's, which shows breadth expansion. So again, cautious about adding here, but we have some great positions. We talked a little bit about how over time it tends to be that you get this push-pull between things that are more basic material and energy related on one end, and technology on the other, and they have traded spots for the largest companies in the S&P over time, Exxon, Microsoft, Exxon, Microsoft, Apple, Apple, Apple. So the question is, can large cap tech do this for another 10 years? 
and have materials and energy underperform for another 10 years? Or are we more likely seeing a reversion or improvement in those groups that have underperformed over the last 10 years? I would say yes. I put this chart up many times. This is Canadian Natural Resources. This chart point here is 2008. It went through a bear market from 2008 through 2021. Now, during that period of time, the energy sector went down 90%. So clearly Canadian Natural Resources is a leader, a company that way, way, way outperformed the group. And since 2021 broke out and consolidated a lot like the, the, uh, the commodity space has. Now, if I had to make a choice, I would bet that we're more likely to see long-term outperformance out of a company that's just come out of a very long bear market and consolidation and is under-owned and probably less uh, 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 lower priced on a relative basis, but we still have to own the things that are leading. So we own large cap tech. Exxon Mobil looks very similar. Tech resources looks very similar. So I think it's fair to say our portfolios are bifurcated. We do have large cap tech. We do understand why it's attractive and the opportunity that is posed by AI and other technologies. But we also recognize when there's something changing in a group that's been out of favor for a long time and has the potential to outperform for many, many years. Industrials. Industrials have been marking their time over the last few weeks. They've held up relatively well versus the market. Breadth has been benign. Machinery breadth has been improving. Uh, uh, defense stocks have been okay. Within the group, mid-sized companies have been outperforming. These are companies that might benefit from reshoring opportunities, bringing manufacturing back to the US uh, and some of the green energy transition. We also really like the companies that are providing services into the electric grid. We know with the EVs coming, they're gonna need to modernize the electric grid, make it smarter uh, and, and more robust. And the companies in this group continue to act well too. So machinery, and in particular, green energy transition and reshoring groups that we're interested in. We talked about home construction outperforming, certainly outperforming out -construct, out so far year to date. A couple of tougher days over the last couple of days as long-term yields have been moving higher. And then there's groups that have been underperforming. And there isn't a lot of change here. Utilities peaked out in September and have been making lower highs ever since. Funny, because if you thought we were headed to a recession, having a high dividend paying security that's not very economically sensitive you would think would be attractive. This group certainly has attracted lots of buyers and lots of people looking to play defense, but really prices aren't supporting that bullish view. Telecom, the same thing. A group that's not very economically sensitive that pays high dividends. But again, for some reason, investors are not able to move these higher. That tells us maybe there's something we aren't considering groups that we're not interested in buying. We buy good, getting better, not broken, hoping that they will get fixed. And healthcare, well, there's some strong pockets, but in general, the relative strength versus the S&P has been falling since early part of December. And this is a group that's down sharply on the year. But some notable exceptions. One of our biggest positions in the firm is Eli Lilly, which is a company that will benefit from a Zempic, the weight loss drug which arguably could be a complete company changer. So when we look at our weightings, we've talked a lot about financials. We have a small overweight here. It's largely in insurance and a couple of very large banks, JP Morgan, which is way outperformed the group and Royal Bank. Technology is a significant weight at 16%, but it's not 25 like the index. And that's just simply because the participation has been very narrow and we think we have the best of the best names. Industrials, we think risk reward plays in our favor here. It's a group that is relatively inexpensive, has a long-term structural change taking place, and whether it's defense or machinery, both are likely to benefit from those tailwinds for many years to come. Energy, after a long period of underperformance, is a double weight. Now, these companies have paid down debt. They are now returning capital to shareholders by way of dividends and share buybacks. And we think that given some of the 
politicizing of moving away from carbon-based energy and the shortage that ultimately will come from that will benefit some of the long life assets like say Meg Energy or uh, Canadian Natural Resources or Suncor bonds. I wanna be clear here. These are very short-term bonds that we're holding about 8% in short-term bonds. And that's just simply keeping our powder dry, having an ability to make money by taking those dollars and using them as we see breadth improve. But it's a cautious stance to have a little bit of cash on the sidelines. Materials are a three times weight of the index for, for reasons we've talked about. Healthcare is underweight, but we do have a couple of strong positions. We have some midterm co corporate bonds. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, very little by way of real estate, very little by way of utilities, very little by way of consumer staples, the most defensive sectors and communication services. This is largely meta would be our one large position that fits into the communication services group. And consumer discretionary is a group that we think would be at risk in the event that there is a recession and in the event that it's the consumer or Main Street. So it's a really, really skewed portfolio. Things outside the US, Europe is performing remarkably well. Japan is having its best year since 1991. Outside of equities, Ethereum is slowly building a base, made a low in June, a higher low in October, sorry, November, a higher low in March, and a higher low recently, and is outperforming the S&P over the last number of months. So a few technical pieces. Despite all of the concerns around recession and the debt ceiling, traders are not paying up for volatility. I think that's interesting. That runs counter to the concern that there's a lot of risk out there. Volatility levels are fairly muted. Sentiment continues to be very weak. A, a, a survey of big money, um, money managers, bulls versus bears, it's about as bearish as it has been other than in 2020, going back over the last 22 years. So sentiment is washed out and negative. There's a ton of cash. People are putting money into money market funds, which we've talked about. We know that hedge funds are record short S&P 500 futures, which means at some point they're gonna have to buy them back. We know that the long short ratio is as short as it's been going back over the last 10 years. And we know from previous webcasts that when the market made its low in the fall of 2022, if you'd looked out from the worst nine month periods and went out beyond six months, virtually all periods were positive. So that's a statistic. That's not something we make decisions based on but we are now beyond the six month mark from the low. And historically that has pointed to a market that it heads higher from here. The one, one uh, um, outlier was 2001. And once the market got out 170 days, it actually had another leg lower. So it's something that we have to watch, but the balance of evidence is that likely recession is priced in. So look, we have to keep this chart in mind. These kinds of corrections in bear markets test our patience. They can be really, really frustrating. They can be a little scary based on the news that we read in the paper and on the web. But so far, this looks nothing like this or this. Those are the things we really worry about. The really bad bear markets, the 50 percenters that are generally caused once there is a recession, and then a credit crisis or a financial crisis that's built on top of it. The Fed has shown willingness to loosen when things get really difficult. And this I don't think would be any different. At this point, this correction looks more like a correction leading to a recession and then on to the next cyclical bull market. But our patience gets tested. I just want to remember what comes after these bear markets. You get long run-ups in price in a broad-based bull market. If things continue to weaken, we'll get more defensive. We've got roughly 10% cash 
between short-term bonds and money market funds in most of the portfolios. We've got flexibility. If individual positions break down, we will sell them. That's what we do. And we'll watch and see the news unfold. So Pam, if there's any questions, certainly happy to answer them. Thanks so much, David. Uh, yes, we have a few questions here. The first one coming from John, who wanted to ask you um, regarding Japan. You mentioned the strength of Japan for a little while. He assumes Japan will be impacted by the recession and is wondering if you think it's a good time to get into Japan, uh, into one of the Japan indexes, such as the FTSE Japan index. Yeah, so, so there's a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, Japanese yen uh, weakened a lot over the last 12 months while the US dollar was rallying. And we know that really since about November, the US dollar has been weakening in fits and starts. So you can buy like the EWJ, um, which is the J Japanese Nikkei index trading in the US priced against yen unhedged. So you're winning right now by the Japanese yen improving and you're winning by the stock market improving. If you wanna just participate in uh, the Japanese market, but hedge it back to US dollars and not take any currency risk, DXJ is another ETF that allow you to do it on a currency hedge basis. The fact that we've had one year after, you know, a 30 year bear market, you know, it, it's not over. It's gonna go on for a long time. Um, this is a big economy. There's some great businesses there. Sentiment, you can imagine, after a 30-year bear market, got pretty negative. Um, and uh, and, the, and the, the, the Bank of Japan has shown a willingness to remain looser than the rest of the central banks uh, because, frankly, they welcome some inflation in the system. Dave, next question here comes from one of your regulars, Lawrence. He wants to know what you're thinking regarding energy. If bullish, do you think you would be more invested in Canada than the US or would you prefer to take a balanced position? Look, think of the political risks outside of the US and think about how um, some of the very large uh, Canadian companies have long life assets like uh, Canadian Natural Resources. I think they're really attractive. Natural gas has been much more volatile than oil. Uh, but even natural gas situation should be getting better as the ability to offtake production and ship it out of the country is is improving. You know, I think it's sad that the, that that a lot of the liquefied natural gas new business is now going to Mexico, uh, uh, which you know it should be coming out of Canada, but we have don't have enough facilities. Um, I think that the Canadian companies are interesting. The U.S. shale companies have much faster decline rates uh, and they're having a hard time keeping their production up. Uh, and I think that that's going to make the Canadian long life assets that much more attractive and they're inexpensive on a global scale. Dave, the final question surrounds the issue with the debt ceiling. And this question comes from Steve. He's wondering how bad is this debt ceiling as a big risk to the market? Do you Look, think... Do you think yeah, the media is trying to scare investors? Look, it's a story, right? And every single time we have come up to this debt ceiling, there is political theater, right? The Republicans are trying to make hay with their base. The Democrats are trying to make hay with their base. The thing you can never forget, they're all Americans. At the end of the day, they want the U.S. dollar to be on the world stage. They want to have a, um, a low cost of capital for their for their companies, um, and so it will get solved. Probably not to the last minute. If you were really worried, the thing you didn't want to, wouldn't want to own is the obligation of the U.S. government, which is Treasury bonds, and maybe that is helping to uh, weaken the prices for treasury bonds recently. Maybe that can help explain why it is that yields have been breaking out to fresh highs. Um, but it shouldn't impact a multinational company. 
like an Apple or an NVIDIA. It shouldn't impact a company like Tech Resources, you know, that sells their goods around the world. These are companies that actually don't have a ton of debt and it's not a major concern. So because we have so little by way of fixed income, I'm not so concerned. Would it be catastrophic for the U.S. bond market for them to default? Yes, yes, absolutely would. It would be tough on the financial system as well for the big financial companies. But I think to bet on something like that happening is a very low percentage bet. Thanks so much, David. That concludes the questions we've received this afternoon. And so, as always, I'll leave you with the final word. Well, I, I know I've said this a number of times, um, you know, markets can be challenging and, and very often it's your patience that's being challenged. Um, it's hard for us to watch so much of the market return this year come from a handful of stocks where realistically we can't pile all of our client portfolios into those groups. So that is frustrating. Um, if, if the groups that we are focused in weren't as resilient as they are in the face of what has been a very aggressive Fed tightening cycle, you know, our portfolios would look different. That's why we do these webcasts. We do these webcasts to say, you know, do our theses continue to hold up or is something changing? Um, so uh, I think the good news is that we've been through three very sizable market adjustments 2018, 2020, and 2022 in our rear view mirror. And now we get to look forwards. So I just would ask people to focus on that because I think that's where the opportunity lies. And we do have to remember that the media is in the business of selling newspapers. And, um, you know, there's always something to worry about. And if you wait till there's nothing to worry about, you're too late. So, um, uh, we'll keep doing these each week, and I apologize again for not being on last week, and uh, we'll look for changes and uh, try and keep focusing in the areas of the market that have a tailwind, and uh, there are some out there. So thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Dave.